This video is made up of excerpts from St. Hildegard's visions. St. Hildegard was given to the church at age 8. She was born at Bacalayam on the Ne, the tenth child of a German count who historians believe was a military man in the service of Mijenhard of Spanheim. Hildegard was sent to be instructed by Mijenhard's sister, Judda, a nun who lived in an enclosed set of rooms, referred to as a vault, in a Benedictine monastery. Hildegard took vows herself at age 15. Sickly most of her life, she lived to the age of 81. As a child she was often too weak to walk and sometimes could not see. As an adult she could be in bed, paralyzed, for days. She had visions of God her whole life. The first shade of the living light came at age 3 and the visitations never stopped. She described one as heaven was opened and a fiery light of exceeding brilliance came and permeated my whole brain and inflamed my whole heart and my whole breast, not like a burning but like a warming flame. At age 43, she said God told her to write down what you see and hear and for the first time revealed her visions to the world. Hildegard obtained power and sometimes used it to defy church authority. When Jutta died, Hildegard was elected magistra of her community of nuns. Near the end of her life she was ordered to dig up the body of a young man buried at the monastery because he had been excommunicated, but she refused. Hildegard wrote nine books, seventy poems, seventy-two songs, and a play. Her books are in print and her music is widely performed today. The Pope authorized Hildegard to preach in public. It was extremely unusual for medieval nuns to leave their enclosed orders or to make public statements, but Pope Eugenius III was consumed with his battle against the Cathar heresies. He needed Hildegard's help. She took her preaching very seriously calling on the Holy Roman Emperor and church leaders to reform their faith and halt abuses. She was considered the dear Abbey of the 12th century. Bishops, nobles, monks, mayors, they all wrote letters to Hildegard seeking advice. She wrote to one monk, just as a mirror, which reflects all things, is set in its own container. So too the rational soul is placed in the fragile container of the body. In this way, the body is governed in its earthly life by the soul, and the soul contemplates heavenly things through faith. She studied the natural sciences and used herbs, tinctures and precious stones as healing medicines. She wrote two treatises on medicine in national history known in English as Book of Simple Medicine and Book of Composed Medicine. Pope Benedict turns to Hildegard's wisdom in times of crisis. Speaking of the sexual scandals of the Catholic Church in 2010, the German-born Pope said, In the vision of Hildegard, the face of the Church is stained with dust, her garment is torn by the sins of priests. The way she saw and expressed it is the way we have experienced it this year. As well as being canonized a saint, she also has been given the title of Doctor of the Universal Church. Book 1 Vision 1 God enthroned shows himself to Hildegard. I saw a great mountain the color of iron, and enthroned on it one of such great glory that it blinded my sight. On each side of him there extended a soft shadow, like a wing of wondrous breadth and length. Before him, at the foot of the mountain, stood an image full of eyes on all sides, in which, because of those eyes, I could discern no human form. In front of this image stood another, a child wearing a tunic of subdued color but white shoes, upon whose head such glory descended from the one enthroned upon that mountain that I could not look at its face. But from the one who sat enthroned upon that mountain many living sparks sprang forth, which flew very sweetly around the images. Also, I perceived in this mountain many little windows, in which appeared human heads, some of subdued colors and some white. And behold, 
He who was enthroned upon that mountain and cried out in a strong, loud voice saying, O human, who are fragile dust of the earth and ashes of ashes? Cry out and speak of the origin of pure salvation until those people are instructed, who, though they see the inmost contents of the scriptures, do not wish to tell them or preach them, because they are lukewarm and sluggish in serving God's justice. Unlock for them the enclosure of mysteries that they, timid as they are, conceal in a hidden and fruitless field. Burst forth into a fountain of abundance and overflow with mystical knowledge, until they who now think you contemptible because of Eve's transgression are stirred up by the flood of your irrigation. For you have received your profound insight not from humans, but from the lofty and tremendous Judge on high, where this calmness will shine strongly with glorious light among the shining ones. Arise therefore, cry out and tell what is shown to you by the strong power of God's help, for he who rules every creature in might and kindness floods those who fear him and serve him in sweet love and humility with the glory of heavenly enlightenment and leads those who persevere in the way of justice to the joys of the eternal vision. 1. The Strength and Stability of God's Eternal Kingdom As you see, therefore, the great mountain the color of iron symbolizes the strength and stability of the eternal kingdom of God which no fluctuation of mutability can destroy, and the one enthroned upon it of such great glory that it blinds your sight is the one in the kingdom of beatitude who rules the whole world with celestial divinity and the brilliance of unfading serenity, but is incomprehensible to human minds. But that on each side of him there extends a soft shadow like a wing of wonderful breadth and length shows that both in admonition and in punishment ineffable justice displays sweet and gentle protection and perseveres in true equity. 2. Concerning Fear of the Lord And before him at the foot of the mountain stands an image full of eyes on all sides. For the fear of the Lord stands in God's presence with humility and gazes on the kingdom of God, surrounded by the clarity of a good and just intention, exercising her zeal and stability among humans. And thus you can discern no human form in her own account of those eyes. For by the acute sight of her contemplation she counters all forgetfulness of God's justice, which people often feel in their mental tedium so no inquiry by weak mortals eludes her vigilance. 3. Concerning those who are poor in spirit And so before this image appears another image, that of a child, wearing a tunic of subdued color but white shoes. For when the fear of the Lord leads, they who are poor in spirit follow, for the fear of the Lord holds fast in humble devotion to the blessedness of poverty of spirit, which does not seek boasting or elation of heart, for love simplicity and sobriety of mind, attributing its just works not to itself but to God in pale subjection, wearing, as it were, a tunic of subdued color and faithfully following the serene footsteps of the Son of God. Upon her head descends such glory from the one enthroned upon that mountain that you cannot look at her face because he who rules every created being imparts the power and strength of this blessedness by the great clarity of his visitation, and weak, mortal thought cannot grasp his purpose, since he who possesses celestial riches submitted himself humbly to poverty. 4. They who fear God and love poverty of spirit are the guardians of virtues. But from the one who is enthroned upon that mountain many living sparks go forth, which fly about those images with great sweetness. This means that many exceedingly strong virtues come forth from Almighty God, darting fire and divine glory, these ardently embrace and captivate those who truly fear God and who faithfully love poverty of spirit, surrounding them with their help and protection. 5. The aims of human acts cannot be hidden from God's knowledge. Wherefore in this mountain you see many little windows, in which appear human heads, some of subdued color and some white. 
For in the most high and profound and perspicuous knowledge of God the aims of human acts cannot be concealed or hidden. Most often they display both lukewarmness and purity, since people now slumber in guilt, weary in their hearts and in their deeds, and now awaken and keep watch in honor. Solomon bears witness to this for me, saying. 6. Solomon on this subject. The slothful hand has brought about poverty, but the hand of the industrious man prepares riches, Proverbs 10 to 4, which means, a person makes himself weak and poor when he will not work justice, or avoid wickedness, or pay a debt remaining idle in the face of the wonders of the works of beatitude. But one who does strong works of salvation, running in the way of truth, obtains the upwelling fountain of glory, by which he prepares himself most precious riches on earth and in heaven. Therefore, whoever has knowledge in the Holy Spirit and wings of faith, let this one not ignore my admonition but taste it embrace it and receive it in his soul. Book 2. Vision 1. The Redeemer. And I, a person not glowing with the strength of strong lions or taught by their inspiration, but a tender and fragile rib imbued with a mystical breath, saw a blazing fire, incomprehensible, inextinguishable, holy living and holy life, with a flame in it the color of the sky which burned ardently with a gentle breath, and which was as inseparably within the blazing fire as the viscera are within a human being. And I saw that the flame sparked and blazed up. And behold! The atmosphere suddenly rose up in the dark sphere of great magnitude, and that flame hovered over it and gave it one blow after another, which struck sparks from it until that atmosphere was perfected and so heaven and earth stood fully formed and resplendent. Then the sun flame was in that fire, and that burning extended itself to a little clot of mud which lay at the bottom of the atmosphere, and warmed it so that it was made flesh and blood, and blew upon it until it rose up a living human. When this was done, the blazing fire, by means of that flame which burned ardently with a gentle breath, offered to the human a white flower, which hung in that flame as dew hangs on the grass. Its scent came to the human's nostrils, but he did not taste it with his mouth or touch it with his hands, and thus he turned away and fell into the thickest darkness, out of which he could not pull himself. And that darkness grew and expanded more and more in the atmosphere. But then three great stars, crowding together in their brilliance, appeared in the darkness, and then many others, both small and large, shining with great splendor, and then a gigantic star, radiant with wonderful brightness, which shot its rays toward the flame. And in the earth too appeared a radiance like the down, into which the flame was miraculously absorbed without being separated from the blazing fire. And thus in the radiance of that dawn the supreme will was enkindled. And as I was trying to ponder this enkindling of the will more carefully, I was stopped by a secret seal on this vision, and I heard the voice from on high saying to me, You may not see anything further regarding this mystery unless it is granted you by a miracle of faith. And I saw a serene man coming forth from this radiant dawn, who poured out his brightness into the darkness, and it drove him back with great force so that he poured out the redness of blood and the whiteness of pallor into it, and struck the darkness such a strong blow that the person who was lying in it was touched by him, took on a shining appearance and walked out of it upright. And so the serene man who had come out of that dawn shone more brightly than human tongue can tell, and made his way into the greatest height of inestimable glory where he radiated in the plenitude of wonderful fruitfulness and fragrance. And I heard the voice saying to me from the aforementioned living fire, O oh you who are wretched earth and, as a woman, untaught in all learning of earthly teaches and unable to read literature with philosophical understanding, you are nonetheless touched by my light, which kindles in you an inner fire like a burning sun, 
cry out and relate and write these my mysteries that you see and hear in mystical visions. So do not be timid, but say these things you understand in the Spirit as I speak them through you, so that these who should have shown my people righteousness, but who in their perversity refuse to speak openly of the justice they know, unwilling to abstain from the evil desires that cling to them like their masters and make them fly from the face of the Lord and blush to speak the truth, may be ashamed. Therefore, O diffident mind, who are taught inwardly by mystical inspiration, though because of Eve's transgression you were trodden on by the masculine sex, speak of that fiery work this sure vision has shown you. The Living God, then, who created all things through his word, by the word's incarnation brought back the miserable human who had sunk himself in darkness to certain salvation. What does this mean? 1. On God's Omnipotence This blazing fire that you see symbolizes the omnipotent and living God, who in his most glorious serenity was never darkened by any iniquity, incomprehensible because he cannot be divided by any division or known as he is by any part of any of his creatures knowledge, inextinguishable, because he is that fullness that no limit ever touched, holy living, for there is nothing that is hidden from him or that he does not know, and holy life, for everything that lives takes its life from him, as Job shows, inspired by me, when he says. 2. Words of Job on this subject. Who is ignorant that the hand of the Lord has made all these things? In his hand is the soul of every living thing and the spirit of all human flesh, Job 12 to 9 10. What does this mean? No creature is so dull of nature as not to know what changes in the things that make it fruitful cause it to attain its full growth. The sky holds light, light air? and air the birds, the earth nourishes plants, plants fruit and fruit animals, which all testify that they were put there by a strong hand, the supreme power of the ruler of all, who in his strength has provided so for them all that nothing is lacking to them for their use. And in the omnipotence of the same maker is the motion of all living things that seek the earth for earthly things like the animals and are not inspired by God with reason, as well as the awakening of those who dwell in human flesh and have reason, discernment and wisdom. How? The soul goes about in earthly affairs, laboring through many changes as fleshly behavior demands. But the spirit traces itself in two ways sighing, groaning and desiring God, and choosing among options in various matters as if by some rule, for the soul has discernment and reason. Hence man contains in himself the likeness of heaven and earth. In what way? He has a circle, which contains his clarity, breath and reason, as the sky has its lights, air and birds, and he has a receptacle containing humidity, germination and birth as the earth contains fertility, fruition and animals. What is this? O oh human, you are holy in every creature, and you forget your Creator, you are subject to him as was ordained, and you go against his commands? 3. That the Word was and is indivisibly and eternally in the Father. You see that that fire has a flame in it the color of the sky which burns ardently with a gentle breath, and which is as inseparably within the blazing fire as the viscera are within a human being, which is to say that before any creatures were made the infinite word was indivisibly in the Father, which in course of time was to become incarnate in the ardor of charity, miraculously and without the stain or weight of sin, by the Holy Spirit's sweet freshness in the dawn of blessed virginity. But after he assumed flesh, the Word also remained inseparably in the Father, for as a person does not exist without the vital movements within his viscera, so the only Word of the Father could in no way be separated from him. 4. Why the Son of God is called the Word And why is he called the Word? Because, 
just as a word of command uttered by an instructor among local and transitory human dust is understood by people who know and foresee the reason he gave it, so also the power of the Father is known among the creatures of the world, who perceive and understand in him the source of their creation, through the word who is independent of place and imperishable in his inextinguishable eternal life and as the power and honor of a human being are known by his official words, so the holiness and goodness of the Father shines through the Supreme Word. 5. By the power of the Word of God every creature was raised up. And you see that the flame sparks and blazes up. This is to say that when every creature was raised through him, the Word of God showed his power like a flash of flame, and when he became incarnate in the dawn and purity of virginity, it was as if he blazed up, so that from him trickled every virtue of the knowledge of God, and man lived again in the salvation of his soul. 6. God's incomprehensible power made the world and the different species. And the atmosphere suddenly rises up in a dark sphere of great magnitude. This is the material of creation while still formless and imperfect, not yet full of creatures, it is a sphere, for it is under the incomprehensible power of God, which is never absent from it, and by the supernal will it rises up in God's great power in the twinkling of an eye. And that flame hovers over it like a workman and gives it one blow after another, which strikes sparks from it, until that atmosphere is perfected and so heaven and earth stand fully formed and resplendent. For the supernal word, who excels every creature, shows that they all are subject to him and draw their strength from his power, when he brought forth from the universe the different kinds of creatures, shining in their miraculous awakening, as a smith makes forms out of bronze, until each creature was radiant with the loveliness of perfection, beautiful in the fullness of their arrangement in higher and lower ranks, the higher made radiant by the lower and the lower by the higher. 7. After the other creatures man was created from earthly mud. But then the same flame that is in that fire and that burning extends itself to a little clot of mud, which lies at the bottom of the atmosphere. This is to say that after the other creatures were created, the Word of God, in the strong will of the Father and supernal love, considered the poor fragile matter from which the weak frailty of the human race, both bad and good, was to be produced, now lying in heavy unconsciousness and not yet roused by the breath of life, and warms it so that it is made flesh and blood, that is, poured fresh warmth into it for the earth is the fleshly material of humans, and nourished it with moisture, as a mother gives milk to her children, and blows upon it until it rises up a living human, for he aroused it by supernal power and miraculously raised up a human being with intelligence of body and mind. 8. Adam accepted obedience, but by the devil's counsel did not obey. When this is done, the blazing fire, by means of that flame which burns ardently with a gentle breath, offers to the human a white flower, which hangs in that flame as dew hangs on the grass. 4. After Adam was created, the Father in his lucid serenity gave to Adam through his word in the Holy Spirit the sweet precept of obedience, which in fresh fruitfulness hung upon the word for the sweet odor of sanctity trickled from the Father in the Holy Spirit through the Word and brought forth fruit in greatest abundance, as the dew falling on the grass makes it grow. Its scent comes to the human's nostrils, but he does not taste it with his mouth or touch it with his hands, for he tried to know the wisdom of the law with his intelligence, as if with his nose, but did not perfectly digest it by putting it in his mouth or fulfill it in full blessedness by the work of his hands. And thus he turns away and falls into the thickest darkness, out of which he cannot pull himself. For, by the devil's counsel, he turned his back on the divine command and sank into the gaping mouth of death, so that he did not seek God either by faith or by works, and therefore, 
weighed down by sin, he could not rise to true knowledge of God, until he came who obeyed his father sinlessly and fully. And that darkness grows and expands more and more in the atmosphere, for the power of death in the world was constantly increased by the spread of wickedness, and human knowledge entangled itself in many vices in the horror of bursting and stinking sin. 9. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the other prophets drove back the darkness. But then three great stars, crowding together in their brilliance, appear in the darkness, and then many others, both small and large, shining with great splendor. These are the three great luminaries Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, symbolizing the heavenly trinity, embracing one another both by their works of faith and by their relationship in the flesh, and by their signs driving back the darkness in the world, and, following them, the many other prophets both minor and major, radiant with many wonders. 10. The prophet John, glittering with miracles, foretold the Son of God. And then a gigantic star appears, radiant with wonderful brightness, which shoots its rays toward the flame. This is the greatest prophet, John the Baptist, who glittered with miracles in his faithful and serene deeds, and pointed out by their means the true word, the true Son of God, for he did not yield to wickedness, but vigorously and forcefully cast it out by works of justice. 11. At the incarnation of the Word of God the Great Council was seen. And in the earth too appears the radiance like the dawn, into which the flame is miraculously absorbed, without being separated from the blazing fire. This is to say that God set a great splendor of light in the place where He would bring forth His Word and, fully willing it, sent Him there, yet not so as to be divided from Him but he gave that profitable fruit and brought him forth as a great fountain, so that every faithful throat could drink and never more be dry. And thus in the radiance of that dawn the supreme will is enkindled, for in the bright and roseate serenity was seen the fruitfulness of the great and venerable council, so that all the forerunners marveled at it with bright joy. 12. Humans must not scrutinize God's secrets beyond what He wishes to show. But you, O oh human, who seek in the way of humans to know more fully the loftiness of this counsel, are opposed by a concealing barrier, for you must not search into the secrets of God beyond those things the Divine Majesty wills to be revealed for love of those who trust in Him. 13. Christ by his death brought back his elect to their inheritance. And you see a serene man coming forth from this radiant dawn, who pours out his brightness into the darkness, and it drives him back with great force, so that he pours out the redness of blood and the whiteness of pallor into it, and strikes the darkness such a strong blow that the person who is lying in it is touched by him takes on a shining appearance and walks out of it upright. This is the Word of God, imperishably incarnate in the purity of unstained virginity and born without pain, and yet not separated from the Father. How? While the Son of God was being born in the world from a mother, he was still in heaven in the Father, and at this the angels suddenly trembled and sang the sweetest praises of rejoicing. And, Living in the world without stain of sin, he sent out into the darkness of unbelief his clear and blessed teachings and salvation, but, rejected by the unbelieving people and led to his passion, he poured out his beautiful blood and knew in his body the darkness of death. And thus conquering the devil, he delivered from hell his elect, who were held prostrate there and by his redeeming touch brought them back to the inheritance they had last on Adam. As they were returning to their inheritance timbrels and harps and all kinds of music burst forth, because man, who had lain in perdition but now stood upright in blessedness, had been freed by heavenly power and escaped from death, as through my servant Hosea I have stated thus. 14. Words of Hosea on this subject 
the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is hidden. The sorrows of a woman in labor shall come upon him, he is an unwise son, for now he shall not stand in the contrition of the sons. I will deliver them out of the hand of death, from death I will redeem them. I will be your death, O death, I will be your destruction, O hell. Hosea 13 11 14. What does this mean? The devil's perverse iniquity is bound by heavy fetters, since he does not deserve that God's seal should release him, for he has never rightfully acknowledged him as do those who faithfully fear him. For the devil always raises himself against God, saying, I am God, and he always goes astray over the blessed one of the Lord opposing the name of Christians because of him. Thus his malice is so ingrained that his sin, cruelly committed in filthy pride, can never deserve by any reparation to be covered by salvation. Therefore he will be in perpetual pain, as a woman in labor is afflicted by despair when she doubts she can survive the opening of her womb. For this misery will remain with him that he is forsaken by beatitude because the wisdom of the sons flees from him, and he does not come to himself, as that man came to himself who returned to his father from his wickedness. Thus he will never stand trusting in that action by which the children of salvation and the heavenly son crush death in its hardened iniquity, which the cunning serpent brought forth when he suggested deceit to the guileless first man. But since those children despise the poison of that unclean advice and look to their salvation, I will deliver them from slavery to idols, for idols are by their deceptiveness in the power of perdition, and for them the unfaithful forsake the honor of their Creator, entangling themselves in the devil's snare and doing his works at his will. And so I will redeem the souls of those who love and worship me, the holy and the just from the pain of hell, for no one can be released from the devil's fetters, which bind him with bitterest death by his transgression of God's precepts, except by the redemption of him who will redeem his elect with his own blood. This is how I will slay you, O death, with utter destruction, for I will take from you the thing you think to live by, and you will be called a useless corpse, at the height of your strength you will lie prostrate as a corpse without the soul lies prostrate awaiting decay. For when the happy souls are mercifully raised up, O oh celestial bliss through the new man, who will not be a party to poisonous deception, the fountain of living water will drown you. Thus also to your confusion I will be your destruction, O oh hell, when my strong power will take from you your ill-gotten spoils, so that you too, justly despoiled will never again appear whole and laden with riches, but will lie prostrate and confounded forever, bearing wounds and decay. 15. The Son of God rising from the dead showed man the way from death to life. And, as you see, the serene man who has come out of that dawn shines more brightly than human tongue can tell, which shows that the noble body of the Son of God, born of the sweet virgin and three days in the tomb, to confirm that there are three persons in one divinity, was touched by the glory of the Father, received the Spirit and rose again to serene immortality, which no one can explain by thought or word. And the Father showed him with his open wounds to the celestial choirs, saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I sent to die for the people and so joy unmeasurable by the human mind arose in them, for criminal forgetfulness of God was brought low, and human reason, which had lain prostrate under the devil's persuasion, was uplifted to the knowledge of God, for the way to truth was shown to man by the supreme beatitude, and in it he was led from death to life. 16. The risen Christ appeared frequently to his disciples. But just as the children of Israel, after being liberated from Egypt, wandered in the desert for forty years before coming into the land flowing with milk and honey, so too the Son of God, rising from the dead, 
showed himself for forty days to his disciples and the blessed women who wept and had a great desire to see him. This he did to encourage them, lest they should waver in faith and say, We did not see him, so we cannot believe that he is our salvation. He showed himself to them frequently, to strengthen them that they might not fall. 17. When Christ ascended to the Father his bride was given many ornaments. And he makes his way into the greatest height of inestimable glory, where he radiates in the plenitude of wonderful fruitfulness and fragrance. This is to say that the Son of God ascended to the Father, who with the Son and the Holy Spirit is the height of lofty and excelling joy and gladness unspeakable, where that same Son gloriously appears to his faithful in the abundance of sanctity and blessedness, so that they believe with pure and simple hearts that he is true God and man. And then indeed the new bride of the Lamb was set up with many ornaments, for she had to be ornamented with every kind of virtue for the mighty struggle of all the faithful people, who are to fight against the crafty serpent. But let the one who sees with watchful eyes and hears with attentive ears welcome with a kiss my mystical words, which proceed from me who am life. Vision 3 After that, I saw a picture of a woman of immense proportions, like a great city, her head crowned with a marvelous diadem, and her arms were surrounded by bracelets, the splendor radiating from the sky over the earth. His belly, his breast was like a net pierced with numerous cavities through which a great multitude of men entered. She had neither legs nor feet, but only stood on her stomach, facing the altar that is before the gaze of God, kissing her with her hands extended. She plunged her penetrating eyes into the immense sky. And I could not distinguish her clothes, except that all radiant with luminous light, she was surrounded with great splendor. On his breast was like a purple dawn, from which I heard, in a marvelous harmony, singing this hymn, as coming forth from the bosom of the splendid Aurora. And this image poured forth its splendor like a garment, saying, I care not to conceive and to give birth. And soon came to her, with the rapidity of lightning, a multitude of angels, raising in her degrees and seating for the men, by whom the image was to be completed. Then I saw black children, crawling between heaven and earth like fish in the water, and penetrating into the belly by the cavities of the image that were open to those who wanted to return. But she groaned attracting higher those who came out of her mouth, and herself remaining in her integrity. And behold, this serene light, and in it the complete human form, shining with a sparkling fire, appeared to me again, as in the vision I had before, and taking the black skin from each of them, casting these spoils out of the way, she put on each of them a tunic resplendent with whiteness and revealed to each of them the bright light, saying, The old iniquity, and clothe the youth of holiness, for the door of your inheritance is open to you. Consider then how you are instructed, in order to recognize the Father whom you have confessed. I received you and you confessed to me. Now therefore look at these two paths, one towards the east, the other towards the Aquilon. If you look diligently at me with your inner eyes, as you have learned by faith, I will receive you in my kingdom. And if you love me perfectly, I will do whatever you ask. But if you despise me, leaving me behind, and leaving me without wishing to know or understand me, you who are plunged into sin, returning to me by a sincere penance, if you have recourse to Satan as if he were your father, then you will fall into perdition, because you will be judged according to your works, for when I gave you good, you did not want to know me. But the children who had returned to the womb of the image walked in the splendor which surrounded it. And she, considering them with kindness, said in a sad voice, Those children who belong to me will return to dust again, yet I conceive and give birth to many which fatigue me, their mother 
by various concussions, and oppress me by fighting by heresies, schisms, and useless quarrels, by rapings and killings, adulteries, fornications, and by many other similar errors. But many of them will rise again in true penance, for eternal life, and many others, by false entanglement, will fall into the second death. And again I heard a voice from heaven which said to me, The complete edifice of living souls, which is lifted up in the heaven of living stones, adorned with the infinite ornaments of virtues, in its sons, like an immense city, it is the enormous crowd of nations, and, as in a large net, a great multitude of fish. He shines with dignity by the virtues from above, according as the work of faithful men prospers in the name of Christ. That is why what you see now, which resembles a woman's image, of immense proportions, as a great city, designates the wife of the Son of God, who always begets sons through the regeneration of the Spirit and the water, since the Almighty Warrior has established it on the greatness of the virtues, to captivate and mold the immense crowd, and to elevate it to the dignity of the elect. And it resembles a great tower, because no enemy can prevail against the one who chases away, it is infidelity by victorious struggles, and is spreading through the works of faith, what in the mortal age is understood in the sense that each faithful sets the example for his neighbor, by which they accomplish many acts of virtue, in view of heavenly things. But when each of the righteous reaches the threads of light, then will be revealed in them the salutary work which they have accomplished, that which cannot be known in the mortality of the earthly powder, because it is impossible to see it in trouble and anxiety. It has its forehead adorned with a marvelous diadem, because, when it was born, when it was raised in the blood of the Lamb, adorned with dignity by the apostles and martyrs, she was united by true betrothal to my son, because in her blood she has built herself faithfully for the edification of the holy souls. That is why, with its arms, a stream of splendor, like marvelous bracelets, radiates from heaven to earth, which means the act of power which is accomplished by the priests, who, with the purity of heart and in the sacrament of the body and blood of the Savior offer, by virtue of good works, the holy sacrifice and the holy altar. The most noble work is that of those who have mercy, who, in their generosity, rescue all sorrows, distributing in the goodness of their heart psalms to the poor, and saying in the perfection of their souls, is not mine, but to him who am created, for this work, inspired by God, is represented before his eyes in heaven when, by the teaching of the church, it is accomplished on earth by faithful souls. But let its belly be like a vast net, having numerous meshes through which the numerous multitude of men penetrate, this signifies the maternal goodness of the church which manifests itself in the capture of faithful souls by the elevation of virtues, by which the believing people converse devoutly in the true faith. But he who throws his net for the capture of fish is my son, the husband of the beloved church whom he married in his blood, to repair the fall of the lost man. She has neither legs nor feet, has not attained to the strength of its constitution, and to the supreme beauty of its perfection, because the time of the son of perdition, the Antichrist, which must mislead the world, must suffer abundantly in its members the violent and bloody persecutions of its cruel perversity, and being led by the calamities of her bloody wounds to the perfect state, she will run with joy in the heavenly Jerusalem, and as she became the beloved new bride of the Son of God in the outpouring of her blood she will be introduced with the same love into the fullness of life amidst the joy of her children. But she stood only on her belly, facing the altar which is before the eyes of God, embraced with her extended hands because she is still pregnant and in childbirth, by true ablution and offers her children very devoutly to God by the very pure prayers of the saints, 
and by the sweet savor of the discernment of hidden or manifest virtues, which are exposed to the eyes of the soul, leaving aside all trace of simulation and every desire of human glory, as incense is purified from every mixture contrary to its perfume, and this fruitful operation is a very acceptable sacrifice in the eyes of God, by which the new wife accomplishes with all the ardor of her desire the works of the fruitful virtues, aspiring to heavenly things, and edifying by the thirtieth, the sixtieth and the hundredth fruit, the high tower of the eternal walls. Therefore she plunges her eyes into the immensity of the heavens, because no perversion can tarnish her intention, which she keeps devoutly in heavenly things, nor the persecution of the diabolical error, nor the heresy of the prevaricating people, nor the agitations of the divine peoples, in whom foolish men cruelly tear themselves in the outburst of their fury. But that you cannot distinguish any of his garments, it means that human intelligence, obscured by the infirmity of its fragile nature, cannot comprehend perfectly its mysteries, except that it is resplendent with marvelous light, it is surrounded by light, because the true sun, by the clear inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the worthy ornament of the virtues, penetrates it on every side. On his breast is like a purple dawn, because in the hearts of the faithful the integrity of the Blessed Virgin, engendering the Son of God, shines with a most ardent devotion. That which makes you hear a series of delicious harmonies, which repeat the praises of the Virgin in the midst of this resplendent dawn, it is because the voice of the believers, as it appears to your mind, rises in a concert unanimous, to exalt with the universal church the virginity without spot of Mary. But let this image extend its splendor as a garment by saying that it is important that it should conceive and give birth, church spreads the dogma of the true trinity, because its veil extends for the protection of the faithful peoples, through which it rises for the edification of living stones, whitened in the fountain of the very pure bath, as is necessary that she confess it for salvation, that she may conceive sons by the good word, and that she may bring them forth into ablution by the regeneration of spirit and water. Hence the multitude of angels, setting seats and degrees in it, for the man by whom this same image is to be finished, is precipitated towards it with the rapidity of lightning, a believing man, manifests the formidable and lovable ministry of the blessed spirits who prepare for these faithful the ascension by faith and hope into the sovereign repose, by which marks one recognizes that the blessed mother the church must attain to her supreme perfection. But then you see black children standing near the ground in the air, like the fish in the water, penetrating into the belly of the image, through the meshes of the net through which it is open those who wish to return, which signifies the blackness of foolish men, who are not yet washed in the bath of salvation, but who, loving earthly things and seeking them in all things, to make their dwelling in their instability, at last reach the mother of holiness, and, considering the dignity of his mysteries, receive his blessing, good word, by which they are taken from the devil and restored to God, submitting to the sacred constitution of the church by which the faithful man must be beatified for salvation, when they say in themselves, I believe in God, and other words concerning the blessed faith. For this blessed mother sighs in her heart, when she consecrates by baptism, with the anointing of the holy chrism, in her heart, the sanctification of the Holy Spirit, so that man, in the true circumcision of mind and water, may be innovated, thereby elevating him to true beatitude, which is the object of all things, and thus become a member of Christ, invocation of the Holy Trinity, as by the mouth of the blessed Mary, man is regenerated for salvation. This mother suffers no injury, because she must remain for eternity in the integrity of her virginity, which is of Catholic faith, for she was born in the blood of the true Lamb her husband who, 
no corruption of his integrity, was born of the very pure virgin. Thus she herself will remain the immaculate bride, whom no schism can corrupt. Often, however, she is persecuted by the perversity of men, but with the help of her husband she keeps herself very powerfully, like the virgin, who, often in the concupiscence of the flesh, is pursued by the malice of the devil, and by the suggestions of many men, by the prayers she addresses to the Lord, she frees herself valiantly from their temptations, and retains her, virginal, beauty. Similarly, the church rejects the perverse corruptors who propagate heresies, those of bad Christians, as well as Jews and other infidels who infect her, wanting to corrupt her virginity, which is the Catholic faith, but she courageously resists them with fear to be corrupt, for she has always been a virgin, she is and will remain virgin, his true faith, which is the matter of his virginity, remaining always free from all error, like the honor of a chaste virgin persevering, in the matter of the modesty of her body, by preserving herself from all defilement of passion. Therefore, Church is the Virgin Mother of all Christians, because it conceives them and gives them birth by the mystery of the Holy Spirit, by offering them to God, so that they are called the Sons of God. And just as the Holy Ghost has covered the Blessed Mother with her ornament, that she may be getting and marvelously bringing forth the Son of God without sorrow, and that she is nevertheless a virgin, thus similarly the Church, the Blessed Mother of Believers, is illustrated by the Holy Ghost, and she simply conceives and generates sons, without any corruption, by remaining virgin. What do you mean? As the bomb drips from the tree, and as the efficacious remedies flow from the onyx vase which encloses them, and as the radiating splendor gushes forth unimpeded from the carbuncle, thus the Son of God is born of a virgin, without any obstacle of corruption, and thus the Church his spouse engenders his sons, without any defilement of error, and remaining virgin in the integrity of the faith. But you see how this splendid light, and in it the form of man, all radiant with a brilliant fire, appears again to you as in an earlier vision, it is because the true Trinity and the true unity, namely the splendid light of the Father, and in the Father, his very sweet Son, who is before the time in the Father according to the Divinity, but is conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin according to the flesh and the time, as has been revealed to you in a true vision, is shown to you now also for the confirmation of faith, because the same blessed Trinity appears, heaven open, to the baptized in baptism, that the faithful man may accept this faith and honor God in three persons, and this, Trinity, also appeared truly in the first baptism. And taking away all their black skin and casting them away from the way, she put on each of them the robe of innocence, and discovers to them a splendid light, by telling them the words of good counsel, because the divine power which sees the hearts of men, mercifully effaces the infidelity of their crimes in the water of baptism, and rejects these sins from the way which is Christ, because death is not in Christ but life, through sincere confession and the ablution of sins since by him every faithful is clothed with the robe of salvation, and through him, the door beaming with brightness of the blessed inheritance of which the first man was driven out, is open to him, being warned by the words of truth to lay down his old habit of iniquity to accept the new gift of grace for salvation. But that the children who had returned to the belly of the image walk in the splendor which surrounds it, that means that those whose holy church has become the mother in the fountain of holy baptism must remain in the divine law who embellishes and adorns this mother, and of whom she hath instructed them, that they may preserve her always, lest by forsaking her, they should not defile themselves again of the sins from which they have been purified. So, looking at them with kindness, she said in a melancholy voice, that these sons who are her own will return to dust, because the same blessed mother, 
loving them with an inner love and compassion for their evils from the depths of her bowels, complains that those whom she has begotten in the bath of regeneration, and who have been purified for heavenly things, again attracted by earthly goods, wallow in sin. How? Because many, accepting externally the faith, fight it internally by various vices, following more the path of error than that of truth, many of them returning from error, and others persevere in iniquity, as this mother proves by the words above. For men recognize themselves by two signs indicated by the law, namely, circumcision for the ancient fathers, and baptism for new doctors, and men are unconcerned to them like the ox to his yoke, for, although he is constrained by the sting, he would draw a furrow if he were not subjected to the yoke. In the same way, men would not walk in my ways if they were not subject to the yoke of my signs. It is as if a young man, walking by some path, his father said to him, walk by the right way, without, however, giving him a sword or other warlike arms, to defend himself in case of peril. What would he do then? He would fly naked, and would neither dare nor defend himself from the peril which threatened him, to divert him from his road, but he would hide himself, because he would not be defended by the terrible armor which might preserve him. So my people would be naked if they were not baptized, therefore it appears terrible to his enemies who see him marked with the anointing of baptism, by which sign he strongly resists those who wish to destroy it whether it be the human crowd or the diabolical legion. But a double law should not be given to Adam. How? I gave him a law, about the tree, of the science of good and evil, when he looked at me in the innocence of his heart, but he himself despised me by submitting to the perfidious suggestions of Satan, which was so detrimental, he can no longer see me with his mortal eyes as long as he remains in this passing century. But because Adam transgressed my precept, he remained without law with all mankind until the time when the great birth of the Son of God was predicted. And the warning of the Holy Ghost to Noah was made when the human race was hastening to its destruction, then, on the flood, the ark was erected, because God foresaw before the ages that after that humanity which had defiled herself with the darkest iniquity, a new race was to arise. For after the death of Adam his race, ignorant that I am God, was wondering, saying, Who is God? Who is God? And there was born among them all evil, so that the ancient serpent, having broken his bonds, them to persuade them to do all his will, for he was then unchained, so that, without being threatened before the flood, the warning of the Holy Spirit was an obstacle to him, as I was his adversary in Noah, by whom a new race was born, when I so instructed my people, that he could not forget my lessons. For the warning of the Holy Spirit was the first threat to Noah, but afterwards circumcision struck him at the jaw, in the person of Abraham, and afterwards the church bound him for a new era until the time when the world passes on the last day. But I permitted Satan to exert his power in the world before the flood because of the ancient struggle in which he conquered Adam, he would have filled his belly with the corpse of all iniquity, and this I permit, because my judgment is just. Wherefore I also raised up the waters of the flood, and slew the sinners, setting aside my mysterious designs Noah, which the same Satan could not despoil, because, by my will, he carried it over the flood. And I pointed out in the flood a very pure germ, namely, by announcing in the new century my son who, coming silently into the world, manifested that the Holy Trinity should be truly adored. How? He showed three wings which signify the Holy Trinity, or you synagogue, you will deny me, there another people will recognize me, and you will glorify me, O Abraham. For you are strengthened by circumcision, you are surrounded by the fortress of the circumcision, Old Testament, 
You are adorned with the dawn of the Son of the Church. For I have given thee circumcision to thee and to thy seed, even unto the coming of my Son, who shall openly forgive the sins of men, and shall cause the fleshly circumcision of the former foreskin to fall, when the fountain of baptism truly arises, in the sanctification of my Son's bath. But those of thy race were not circumcised, in the time which had been prescribed for them, whether they were young or advanced in age, transgress the covenant of my covenant, except the women to whom circumcision was not ordained, for the woman cannot be circumcised, because the maternal womb is in her, and cannot be touched externally, and because it is under the power of the husband, as the servant under that of his master. For man has three motives of his actions, concupiscence, strength and love. Lust arouses strength and inclination toward the object, the ardor of the will arise from both. This is so, as in the creation of Adam three causes are manifested, because the will of God has formed man to manifest his power, and he has completed his work to prove his infinite love when he has created man in his image and likeness. On the one hand, the will of God, on the other, the concupiscence of man, the power of God and the strength of man, love from the will and power of God, the inclination of concupiscence and the strength of man. In this way the human race is procreated by man, woman, because God made man the silt of the earth, and woman is constituted, by virtue of honor, procreative, like the earth, in virtue of the germ, to produce fruit. What do you mean? The woman, at the desired time, feels in herself that mood which pours in her heat and procreative virtue, otherwise it would not receive man voluntarily but despising it, it would oppose its will, and procreation would not occur. For if it had not in it, by the heat, procreative virtue, it would remain sterile, like the barren earth which cannot be fertilized. But this virtue does not always produce in woman, by the heat, the fire of ardent concupiscence, before, touched by man, she feels the ardor of passion, for in her, concupiscence is not so strong and so ardent as in man, who is powerful as the lion, for the concupiscence of the work of procreation, so that it has the power of concupiscence and act, the woman being able only to submit to the empire of her will, for she is occupied with procreation, until she produces her sons in the world. When the woman loves my son, desiring, in her love, to observe virginity, she is all beautiful in her nuptial bed, because she despises the ardor which she supports for her charity, not wishing to be consumed by the fire of passion, persevering in her modesty, for she despises the carnal man in his spiritual marriages, longing for the possession of my son and rejecting the memory of the fleshly man. O oh dear dear ones! O oh, flower softer and sweeter than all perfumes! Or the weak and weak nature rises like the dawn to the marriage of my son, the lover of a chaste love, she, being his wife, and being her husband, for he loves infinitely this race of virgins, who ought to be omnipotent in the kingdom from above. But still? When the virtue of man refuses to contract the matrimonial bond, so that man, for the sake of my son, is constrained in the vigor of his nature, blossoms in view of procreation, repressing its members so that they do not exert the concupiscence of the flesh, this is very pleasing to me, because man in this way is conquering himself. Therefore I will make him the companion of my son, and I will place him as a very pure mirror before his face, because he courageously resists the demon who had attracted to him the human race by the infidelity of his shameful fault. In order that he might be torn from his bonds, I sent my son into the world, born of a very gentle virgin, without any defilement of sin, causing the fountain of salvation to flow, which the innocent lamb himself consecrated, that the foreskin of the old crime might be abolished by him. 
What does this mean? The very faint foreskin, is the crime of Adam's transgression, which my son took away, when he entered into the fountain of salvation, divinely consecrated the Christian cohort, that the ancient serpent who had deceived man should be drowned in this bath. How? The son answers the condition of his father, and keeps his inheritance. What does this mean? The race of Adam, through his transgression, was driven out of paradise, and by the baptism of salvation, she received a new life from my son. How? He himself uttered the voice of the good word to the unbelievers who resisted my precepts, so that, in fear, they would ask for forgiveness in a spirit of contrition, as Isaiah my servant, according to what he received from me, bears witness to it by saying, and they will come to you, the humbled sons of those who had humbled you, and they will worship the vestiges of thy footsteps, those who calumniate thee. 1, and come ad te curvi filicorum which humiliaverunte, and adorab ent vestigia pedum chaurum omnes which detrament to be. What does this mean? O oh, you who are the supreme peace and the pure sun, through you will germinate the living root which is the regeneration of mind and water, when they come to know you, those who, in the womb of their crimes, were under a curse, and thus, humiliated, they will rise at last for truth and justice. How? They will taste the maternal sweetness of the true faith by seeing it, without understanding it, but by grasping it by the fidelity of their belief. And what are those? Those who, out of the midst of them by the materiality of sin, never saw you with ardent charity, but by cruelly oppressing you, grieved you obstinately, as if you did not carry it over them, and, returning to better sentiments, loved you affectionately. And therefore, when they have embraced the true faith, they will regard you as their king and worship you as Lord, and they will hasten to run following the sacred paths you have pointed out to them, so that they will always behold you with your hands raised to you, and they will always be with you in the performance of good works, by faith, that is to say, boredom in your presence, and they shall do so, which before have tired thee without fear and without respect, and in hatred and envy separated from thee before they saw thee in the fervor of their faith, unite to you lovingly. What does this mean? The fall of Adam closed the sky in my indignation, when the man despised me and listened to the snares of the serpent. This is why the glory of paradise was forbidden to him. And this degradation lasted until the manifestation of my son, who by my will entered the waters of the Jordan, or my voice is clear, when I say that he was my beloved son, in whom I have put all my complacence because I wanted at the end of time to redeem man by my son, who is united to me by a bond of love, as indissolubly as the ray adheres to honey, and who also pointed out to me, when he, the fountain of salvation, resurrected, the souls of eternal death, granting them the remission of sins, in the water, by the Holy Spirit. This is why the Holy Spirit appeared to him, because the remission of sins is done by him to the faithful, when, through a mystical mystery, the Holy Spirit, in the form of a gentle and naive dove, manifested my son single, for the Holy Ghost is infinite justice and the sincere dispenser of all perfect gifts. And it was fitting, because my son was born of a virgin, without any defilement of crime, that man, born of sin, of man and woman, might be reborn splendidly and gloriously without sin, as my son himself says to Nicodemus in the Gospel, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if any man be not born of water and water, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 1, Amen, Amen Dico to be, Nicyque was renatus fuer ex aqua and spiritual, non potest intro ire in regnum de John 3, what does this mean? 
I tell you with a constant and no recertainty with an unstable ambiguity, to you who were born of corruption, that the man who was begotten in the heat of concupiscence and wrapped in a contaminated garment, reborn not in the true joy of the new birth, in the water of sanctification and the spirit of enlightenment, will be confounded in the time of his negligence. How? Because man, like water, floods with the spirit of his strength, and just as water purifies defilements, and the spirit vivifies inanimate things, if he is not purified in a true generation, he cannot become the heir to the kingdom of his creator through the door of salvation because he is embarrassed in the bonds of the sin of the first father, that Satan deceived fraudulently. How? For, as the thief who wishes to take the precious treasure of the king, sneaks in, so a defective conception is insinuated by the orifice dug by the artifice of Satan, so that he evilly removes himself, and those who are the tabernacle of the Holy Spirit, the pearl of innocence and chastity. Therefore they must now be purified by the holy operation of ablution. For the mortal ardor which passion aroused in the increase of concupiscence, arising from the prevarication of the precepts of the Almighty God, was to be extinguished, submerged, by him who never enviously conceals his wonders, but reveals them mercifully in his incomprehensible love. Here then the Son in his constitution for the regeneration which is the revelation of my kingdom, and learn from him, to fulfill my precepts. Do this, for it pleases me, and take heed that the ancient serpent will not deceive you, and you will not die, if you keep the innocence of your baptism as it is commanded you, in the name of the Holy Trinity. And whenever you fall, rise up, correcting yourself, by the penance you will make of your faults, according to my mercy. O you, my beloved sons, recognize the goodness of your Father, who has delivered you by virtue of his merits, by sincere confession and true forgiveness, from the mouth of the devil, and who has granted you all the goods by virtue of which you must work to possess the heavenly Jerusalem, which you have lost by a disastrous deceit, for no one can recover the lost inheritance, except through the sweat of labor. But you can receive the supreme blessedness, that is, the excellence of your inheritance easily and not by virtue of a difficult law. For the Holy Ghost, as has been said, expels man from the power of Satan by baptism sanctifying him as a new man by regeneration, so that he may recover the lost joys. Therefore, whoever wishes to be saved by the purification of sins, be regenerated. For I have commanded the males of the seed of Abraham the circumcision of a single limb, but by my son I have prescribed to the men and women of all nations the circumcision of all the members. How? The circumcision of baptism originated in the baptism of my son, and it must last till the last day, and after that day his holiness shall endure forever and shall have no end, and thus those who are circumcised in the bath of baptism will preserve themselves, if they persevere in baptismal innocence, by the accomplishment of good works, because I will receive the man, young or advanced in age if he is faithful to the covenant which he has contracted with me, believing in my word, by confessing himself in the true trinity, by himself or by those who answered for him, whether he was a child, or because he was silent and deprived of the word, he had to borrow the language of others, and I will not lose it for eternity, as he who would have refused to have recourse to this fountain, and to perform the works of faith, as it is written in the doctrine of the Gospel of my Son, He that believeth and shall be baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. 1. Who cred I derit and baptizatus few are it, salvis erit that vero non cred I derit condemnabitur. Mark 16, What does this mean? The man who, by his science, which is the inner eye, sees what is hidden from the external gaze, and has no doubt of these things, 
he believes in a very sure way, and it is faith, for, what man sees externally, he knows it also externally, and what he sees in himself, inside, he also considers in himself. Therefore, when the science of man looks lovingly through the mirror of life, the incomprehensible divinity which the outer eye cannot contemplate, then the desires of the flesh are repressed and clash against the stone. The spirit of this man aspires to the true summits, feeling this regeneration, which the Son of Man, conceived of the Holy Spirit, brought, that a very pure mother received, not from the flesh of man who sorrow in voluptuousness, but by a mystery of the Creator of all things. This Son full of sweetness, in this world, showed in the water a very pure and living mirror, so that through him man lives in regeneration. And just as man is born of the flesh by the divine power which creates him on the form of Adam, so the Holy Spirit restores life to the soul by the baptism of water, it receives in it the spirit of man, to resurrect it to life, as it was formerly aroused in the blood when it manifested itself in the corporeal vessel. In the same way, in fact, the form of man takes a sensible way, when it is called man, thus the spirit of man before the eyes of God is vivified in water, baptism, so that God recognizes it for the inheritance of life. Hence it is that he who purifies himself at the fountain of salvation, and does not violate the pact of justice, finds life and salvation because he believed faithfully. But he who does not wish to believe is dead, because he does not possess the breath of the Spirit, which can make him fly in the heights of heaven. But in his blindness he is astonished, not living in the dark science of the flesh, because he is ignorant of the discipline of life which God has inspired in man, who wishes to rise higher against the will of the flesh. Therefore, he will be condemned in the death of infidelity because he has not received the baptism of salvation. For I have neither set aside time nor the races of this salvation, but I have mercifully given this vocation to every people by my Son. Indeed, at any time, passing hours, of whatever sex or age, man, male or female, child or old man, when he receives baptism in a feeling of devotion, receive with the help of love. And I do not refuse the bath of the baptism of the child, as some false teachers say, and they lie by pretending that I disdain such an oblation, since in the Old Testament I did not refuse the circumcision of the child, which he himself could not ask in his voice, nor accept by his will, but the parents accomplished for him. So also, in the new grace, I do not disdain the baptism of the child, though he does not ask for it by his word or his consent, but these things being done for him, through the intermediary of the parents. And yet, if he, the baptized, desires salvation, he must do the most fairly the faithful promise that his people have made for him, by presenting him to the sacred fountain. They must be three, in honor of the Holy Trinity, namely, the priest who baptizes him, and to others who pronounce the words of faith for him. But they are thus united by baptism to the baptized, and they cannot be united to him for the fleshly procreation, because of the spiritual bond which binds them to him. For in the baptism of my son, Father I manifested myself, what the priest who blesses in the administration of baptism, and the Holy Ghost ascended in the form of a dove, what is indicated, in the simplicity of the heart, he who speaks to instruct him who receives baptism, and my son, who was to be baptized in the flesh, was there, what the woman in her maternal sweetness indicates, for the very sweet incarnation of that same son. And now? Just as the child nourishes bodily nourishment of milk and food prepared for him by another, so similarly he must observe from the bottom of the heart the doctrine and faith offered to him in baptism. That if he does not suck the mother's breast and does not take the food that is prepared for him, 
he immediately dies, so, if he does not receive the nourishment of his most pious mother the church, not the words which the faithful doctors propose in baptism, avoid the cruelty of the death of the soul, because it refuses the salvation of its soul and the delights of eternal life. And just as for the child who cannot chew his bodily food with his teeth, another prepares them for him, lest he die, so similarly one must do, when he has no word, to confess my faith in the baptism of spiritual tutors must offer him food of life, that is, the Catholic faith, lest he fall into the bonds of eternal death. How? The Lord proposes to his servant his will, through the voice of him that teacheth, and he fulfills it by fear, and the mother instructs her daughter in charity, and she observes her words with fidelity, and similarly, the debtors of the faith speak in a timely manner the words of salvation to the baptized, that the latter may observe them with faithful devotion for the sake of heavenly goods. For no one is crushed under the weight of sins, if, in the name of the Most Holy Trinity, he is sent into Saint Baptism, he who clears away all uncleanness from his sins, as in the child who is plunged into the fountain of regeneration, I really erase the fault of Adam. But you do not admire, O oh man, that in the fountain of baptism man is justified with all his pecuniaries, so that he is mercilessly cleansed of the weight of his sins. For the innocent lamb, who, without any defilement of sin, has returned to the waters of baptism, by virtue of the great means of sanctification which is his incarnation, has removed mercy, in baptism, the sins of men. But I scrutinize all things minutely, and in this century and in eternity, or the death of bodies is not, and all things are, for me, without veils. What does this mean? Gehenna is proved by the works of death and eternal life by works which are a pledge of life. How? Death is proved by death, because when man, through a just judgment of God, dies in sin without penance and without the mercy of God, which he does not ask for, his death is solved by the death death of hell. But life is proved by life, so that good works shine in heaven, they are dominated by eternal life. So then, those who are baptized in the fountain of blessing, are tested in the works of holiness of holy regeneration. And when, in this case, I am invoked by the supplications of the blessing of the priest, my ears open to the words of faith, although the one who invokes me then is in the fetters of sin. For though the priest is a sinner, yet I accept from him the office of baptism if he exercises it faithfully by the invocation of my name. But his iniquity will be his own condemnation, if he perseveres in it without doing penance. However, I do not refuse to receive from him the celebration of baptism, when he invokes me with the words of faith. What does this mean? If any rich man has an intendant, who fairly dispenses his property to his soldiers, Thus faithfully exercising his employment, though the same dispenser is guilty, on another point of his management, his master nevertheless does not disdain to receive from him may he say to him, you are a bad servant in the performance of your duty. Which makes him regard him as unworthy in his mind, without disdaining to receive the works of his justice. So, similarly, I, who have many dispensers, I do not refuse to receive my sacrament from the hands of the priest, who legitimately anoints faithfully in his office, though he is reprehensible in his other works, and while judging it contrary to me, by his other unjust acts, I do not refuse, however, to receive from him what is mine. If someone wants to be baptized, thinking that the separation of his soul and his body is near, and when he has asked for a priest, he cannot get it, so if someone pours water on him, invoking the Holy Trinity, he is baptized. And by this ablution he receives the remission of his sins and the grace of supreme beatitude, because he is baptized in the Catholic faith, 
and this baptism cannot be changed. But, in this invocation, none of these three ineffable persons can be omitted, for if one of the three is omitted by infidelity in the invocation, then truth does not work salvation, but rather error causes disappointment. Therefore, the invocation of this ineffable trinity cannot fail, for the trinity manifested itself in the very pure baptism of my son, and she declared wonderfully, by herself, her miracles. Therefore, that men who wish to be saved receive, for salvation, the regeneration of life, and do not neglect to receive it, if they will not perish, and just as an abortion, which perishes without vital heat, is rejected without being able to attach itself to the maternal end rails either in its formation or in its increase, likewise, in the peril of death, remain without the consolation of the Holy Spirit, those who are not purified in the Spirit, nor in the act of the sacrament of the Church, which is the mother of all holiness. Let all the people hear and hear these words, if they wish to penetrate into the Kingdom of God, by the regeneration of spirit and water, according to what was offered them in the Holy Scriptures by the gift of the Holy Mind. But he who sees with his open eyes and listens to his attentive ears delights in these mystical words which emanate from me who am life. Vision 6 Christ's Sacrifice and the Church And after these things I saw the Son of God hanging on the cross, and the aforementioned image of a woman coming forth like a bright radiance from the ancient council. By divine power she was led to him, and raised herself upward so that she was sprinkled by the blood from his side, and thus, by the will of the Heavenly Father, she was joined with him in happy betrothal and nobly dowered with his body and blood. And I heard the voice from heaven saying to him, May she, O son, be your bride for the restoration of my people, may she be a mother to them, regenerating souls through the salvation of the spirit and water. And as that image grew in strength, I saw an altar, which she frequently approached, and there each time looked devotedly at her dowry and modestly showed it to the Heavenly Father and His angels. Hence when a priest clad in sacred vestments approached that altar to celebrate the divine mysteries, I saw that a great calm light was brought to it from heaven by angels and shone around the altar until the sacred rite was ended and the priest had withdrawn from it. And when the gospel of peace had been recited and the offering to be consecrated had been placed upon the altar, and the priest sang the praise of Almighty God, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, which began the mystery of the sacred rites, heaven was suddenly opened and a fiery and inestimable brilliance descended over that offering and irradiated it completely with light, as the sun illumines anything its rays shine through. And, thus illuminating it, the brilliance bore it on high into the secret places of heaven and then replaced it on the altar as a person draws in a breath and lets it out again, and thus the offering was made true flesh and true blood, although in human sight it looked like bread and wine. And while I looked at these things, suddenly there appeared before my eyes as if in a mirror the symbols of the Nativity, Passion and Burial, Resurrection and Ascension of our Savior, God's only begotten, as they had happened to the Son of God while He was on earth. But when the priest sang the song of the innocent Lamb, O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, and prepared to take the Holy Communion himself, the fiery brilliance withdrew into heaven, and as it closed I heard the voice from thence saying, Eat and drink the body and blood of my Son to wipe out Eve's transgression, so that you may be restored to the noble inheritance. And as other people approached the priest to receive the sacrament, I noticed five modes of being in them. For some were bright of body and fiery of soul, and others seemed pale of body and shadowed of soul, some were hairy of body and seemed dirty in soul, because it was pervaded with unclean human pollution, 
others were surrounded in body by sharp thorns and lepers of soul, and others appeared bloody of body and foul as a decayed corpse in soul. And all these received the same sacraments, and as they did, some were bathed in fiery brilliance, but the others were overshadowed by a dark cloud. And when these mysteries were finished, as the priest withdrew from the altar the calm light from heaven, which, as said, had shone round the whole altar, was drawn up again into the secret places of heaven. And again I heard the voice from the supernal heavens, saying to me, 1. The church was joined to Christ in his passion and dowered with his blood. When Jesus Christ, the true Son of God, hung on the tree of his passion, the church, joined to him in the secret mysteries of heaven, was dowered with his crimson blood, as she herself shows when she often, approaches the altar and reclaims her wedding gift, carefully noting with what degree of devotion her children receive it when they come to the divine mysteries. Therefore you see the Son of God hanging on the cross, and the aforementioned image of a woman coming forth like a bright radiance from the ancient council, and by divine power she is led to him. For when the innocent lamb was lifted up on the altar of the cross for human salvation, the church suddenly appeared in heaven by a profound mystery, in purity of faith and all the other virtues, and by the supreme majesty she was joined to the only begotten of God. What does this mean? That when blood flowed from the wounded side of my son, at once salvation of souls came into being for the glory from which the devil and his followers were driven out was given to humanity when my only begotten suffered temporal death on the cross, despoiled hell and led the faithful souls to heaven. Therefore, in his disciples and their sincere followers faith began to increase and strengthen, so that they became heirs of the celestial kingdom. Hence that image raises herself upward so that she is sprinkled by the blood from his side, and thus, by the will of the Heavenly Father, she is joined with him in happy betrothal. For when the strength of the passion of the Son of God flows burningly forth and rises to the height of the celestial mysteries, as the perfume of spices diffuses itself upward, the Church, fortified by that strength in the pure airs of the Eternal Kingdom, is faithfully joined by the High Father's decision to the Only Begotten of God. How? As a bride, subjected to her bridegroom in her offering of subordination and obedience, receives from him a gift of fertility and a pact of love for procreating children, and educates them as to their inheritance. So to the Church, joined to the Son of God in the exercise of humility and charity, receives from him the regeneration of the Spirit and water to save souls and restore life and sends those souls to heaven. Therefore she is nobly dowered with his body and blood, for the only begotten of God conferred his body and blood in surpassing glory on his faithful, who are the church and her children, that through him they may have life in the celestial city. How? 2. God conquered the ancient serpent by his son's humility, not his power by giving his body and blood to sanctify those who believe, and so the Heavenly Father delivered him up to the passion for the redemption of the peoples and conquered the ancient serpent through him in humility and justice. He did not want his son to conquer by his power and strength, for God is just and does not will iniquity, as the psalmist declares, saying. 3. Words of the Psalmist Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly, or stood in the way of sinners, or sat in the seat of the pernicious, Psalm 1 to 1. What does this mean? God is the Father of all the bliss and happiness of his creatures and shows many and various signs in them, and the incarnation of his Son dripped with the sweet taste of delight for in him the heavenly virtues built many mansions through which humanity can return to the supernal kingdom, which is darkened by no shadow of death. And thus the strongest powers of virtue were shown to be in the heavenly Father, 
for it was he through his only begotten who slew death and broke hell, and on the last day he will make the world anew and better. Therefore, he has not, through any wavering of his heart, wandered away into the paths of the evil spirits, who forsook the truth and seized on the lie. How? They wanted to use the lie to divide the truth. How? By trying to overthrow the Ancient of Days, who was before days and hours began, and by yearning to make a partner for him of the Ancient Serpent, who before time began was not. But that could not and should not be, for there is one God. And therefore the devil is a liar, for he withdrew from God and forsook life to find death. And so, indeed, God did not stand in the path that sinners walk. He condemned Adam's choice and did not love his sin, but when he was seduced by the devil he drove him from paradise. And he did not train in any seed of wicked power, as does the whole human race, which is bound up with death and sits in its shadow because it arrogantly deserted. There is a break here. Blood shall groan in that person because the flesh and blood of my son have been carelessly treated by that person, as the earth quaked and people were shaken by fear when my son gave up his spirit on the cross. 60. The mystical secrets of the Lord's body and blood must not be looked into. But if you, O human, say to yourself in your vacillating heart, how did the oblation on the altar become the body and blood of God's Son? I will answer you, why, O human, do you ask this, and for what purpose do you inquire about it? Do I require you to know it? Why do you peer into my secrets about the body and blood of my Son? You should not seek out these things, but only keep them diligently and accept them in fear and veneration. Do not pause at this mystery any longer, for you must not tempt me so rashly. What are these things to you? Only seek after me by sure faith. For when I look into all your faith, I do not ask you to know what is the nature of the body and blood of my son, or how this mystery is consecrated on the altar. And who asks you, O oh human, to stand in fire and not feel its burning? No one. So do not rashly peer into my secrets, lest you be wounded thereby. But if in your devout mind you wish to seek them, do so in diligent prayer and weeping and fasting, as your early fathers certainly sought and often found them. And when you have thus sought and found, you will give what is left to the Holy Spirit. But let those who approach those sacraments come not by devious paths but by the right way lest they be cast out from them and suffer ruin and soul. How? 61. Churchmen who go in by wrong ways imitate the devil, Baal and crucifiers. The evil deceiver who wrongly usurps the chair of the episcopal office without being elected or properly anointed, and the wicked robber who expels his pastor by the whispers of his henchmen and violently invades his throne will either undergo grave expiation by their own will or incur serious condemnation by my wrath. For they are in the worst possible state of bitterness, imitating the one who wanted the highest honor for himself and was cast out of glorious happiness into death, and following Baal, who so deluded himself that he wrongly named himself a god and was given over to destruction. And if in their lying and presumptuous wickedness they pretend to confer my holy orders, those who receive from them order rather than orders are accounted in my sight no more than those who are jestingly appointed by children in their games to be laughed at by people. As this kind of thing is nonsense among people, so what these intruders pretend to do in their deceit is mockery to me. Thus their edifice is wicked and cannot stand, for it is a void. And if they appear to set up anything in my temple in holy orders, it must be abolished, for it has no righteousness and is thus worthless. Let them, therefore, turn back from their temerity, lest they share the punishment of him who sought more than he should have and was thrown from the summit into the abyss.
and the butcher who insanely approaches my altar without the anointing of the priestly office, as if I were as great an impostor as he is a jester, and rashly touches the table consecrated to my name to offer the sacred oblation without having the qualifications, does not fear to wound my son with dire torment. How? As the unbeliever assails God with his incredulity, and the madman in his insanity runs into burning fire, so this one, not knowing that I am God or feeling my burning fire, casts off his fear of me and does not love my mercy, but, with unanointed lips, he dismembers those words my only begotten gave his bride when he dowered her with his body and blood, and thus wounds my son. And it will be said to this rash attacker, who touches my son, so arrogant and unanointed. But he who thus approaches my altar and presumes to invoke my son with the secret words tries to wound him not because he can put him to any pain, but because he fearlessly and presumptuously touches him. If he persists without penitence in this contempt, he will stand in the place of punishment among those who causelessly wounded my son. Lest he fill these dormants, then, let him adopt as his own the lamentation of affliction and never again presume to approach the ministry of my altar. And let those who hold some church office that involves serving under a priest never presume to usurp his ministry unjustly, for if they wrongfully claim that righteousness for themselves, they may justly be judged unformed and rough and rejected for the construction of the edifice of the church. For I will that my ministers shall be pure in my sight, without deceit and without stain. How? They should be duly chosen to approach my altar, and once there they should serve me without impurity. How? 62. Priests should observe chastity like the apostles. Let them not look to an earthly marriage, for they have chosen a spiritual one. How? By entering upon my service. And if any of them suffers from the burning lust of the flesh, let him subdue his body with abstinence and fasting and chastise himself with cold and scourging. And if after all he defiles himself with a woman, let him fly from that contamination as from a burning fire or a deadly poison and cleanse his wounds with bitter penance, for I wish to be served in chastity. How? Because my son was the height of chastity, and he represented in himself all ecclesiastical ranks. How? Those that serve, proclaim, preach and offer. How? He touched service in his circumcision, proclaimed by his prophecies, preached himself to humanity, and at last offered himself as a living sacrifice on the altar of the cross. And he gave himself as a burnt offering in chastity, so let those who seek to offer a burnt offering to him on the altar imitate his chastity. They must not only guard chastity in others but preserve it in themselves. How? As a priest should keep himself from contamination with a woman, let him also keep himself from himself, let him take care not to arouse defilement in himself by the touch of his hands, so that the clamor of lust may not make a sinful tumult within him, for the crime of Adam, which brought death to man, aroused his senses to fornication, so let people restrain their flesh so as not to undergo a shameful death. How? My son conquered death and gave them life, and since he assumed flesh and the integrity of virginal chastity, those who desire to serve him ought also to be chaste, as is written in the divine command. 63. Words of Moses on this subject. Be ready against the third day, and come not near your wives, Exodus 19:15. What does this mean? You who wish to serve God alone, be prepared with willing hearts for the day of His serenity, when the Holy and Ineffable Trinity will truly appear and show its wonders in a great miracle, and if you wish to be worthy to draw near to Him, take care not to join in carnal unions of physical love, so as not to mingle your blood with blood that is deemed weaker. You, 
O oh my priest and other ministers, who fight under a spiritual name, beware of this, for the apostles to whom you have succeeded did not divide themselves between opposites or leave you such an example. 64. A priest should not have two marriages. For I do not want priests to have two unions, one of spiritual and one of carnal desire, the priest should be married to the justice of God, and treat it as his wife, with which to nourish and teach the rest of the people as a father brings up and teaches his children, how is it appropriate for a priest to maintain in the right proportions two different and opposing marriages? How? One carnal and the other spiritual. 65. How the devil may be the priest of bad priests. The priest is the pastor and father of the people who have physical marriages, so if he has one to the same extent, who will be his priest? No other priest could be his superior, since all priests are ministers of a single office, except the devil, who is appropriate as his priest because he has imitated the devil in hiding poison under honey. How? As the devil hides evil under good, so do such priests who love their own dishonor better than chastity, try to hide a carnal union under a spiritual marriage, like poison under honey. But, since my son is wholly chaste, those who touch his body and blood on the altar should also love chastity, as it is written. 66. Words of the Law on this Subject a priest shall not take to wife a harlot or a base prostitute or a woman repudiated by her husband, for he is sacred to his God and offers the bread of God, Leviticus 21-7-8. What does this mean? Let one who is appointed to offer sacrifice to God not love the devil, the common author of all filth and wickedness, or degrade his senses in such a way that when he tries to bear my yoke he will instead have to follow the will of his flesh, contrary to the justice of God and the examples of the ancient saints, lest he come by bad deeds to the impurity that was spurned by those ancient fathers, who knew it to proceed from the breath of the ancient serpent. Let him therefore leave this filth and become a lover of the righteousness of God, for he is sacred to God and holiness, and thus removed from carnal desire and the deeds that bring children into the world. And so, sober and unpolluted, he may offer that bread which is placed on the table of consecration for human salvation. What does this mean? That sacrifice, which is the life of the living and the refreshment of souls and the mirror of all the virtues, which shine in holy innocence through chastity, is free from every stain, and therefore those who offer the sacrifice should be free of filthy pollution and hold themselves back from feasts and drunkenness, jesting and laughing, and light and undisciplined behavior. Let them be held in the reverence that becomes successors of the ancient fathers who set them up and in the dignity proper to their honorable patrons. So let them not live doubly in two roles, and walk at the same time in the secular and the spiritual way, for it is hard to serve two masters at once, as my son testifies in the Gospel, saying. 67. Words of the Gospel on this subject. No one can serve two masters, Matthew 6 24. What does this mean? No one who is clothed in mortal flesh can offer two masters similar and equal service, because of the weakness of his senses and his body. What does this mean? He cannot serve at once the Lord of Righteousness and the Lord of Injustice. Why? Because righteousness casts out injustice, and injustice sells righteousness. And so too a priest cannot at once and with equal devotion have the handmaid and the mistress, carnal marriage and spiritual companionship, for these two cannot exist side by side in perfection, for the carnal assails the spiritual, and the spiritual bears down the carnal. Thus my friend Paul, knowing this to be so, shows my will when he says. 68 words of the Apostle on this subject. 
A bishop therefore should be blameless, the husband of one wife, 1 Timothy 3-2. What does this mean? One who is superior to others in a spiritual office must regulate his life so that no scandal of offense or reproach will be found in it. How? A priest should not have two roles and be at the same time the husband of a physical wife and of a spiritual spouse, but he should be the husband of one wife, namely the Holy Church, which is one in my son because she arose as one church in him. But though the church is one, she has many husbands, entering into marriage with the priests of my son who are daily in his service, yet she remains an intact virgin for in her the faith is uncorrupted. And therefore Paul, my vessel, did not say she was the wife of one husband, for she is joined in marriage to all those priests who will arise in my only begotten till the last day, when the immortal and unfailing nuptials will take place. And those who minister to the altar under the priests are also husbands of the same wife, as Paul said, offering my faithful doctrine to humanity. 69. Again Paul on this subject. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, who rule well their children and their houses, 1 Timothy 3:12. What does this mean? Let those who render service to the priest and assist them be the husbands of one wife by faithful marriage. And who is this wife? the chaste bride who can be injured by no corruption, as a woman is corrupted when she loses the flower and innocence of virginity, which she had at the beginning of her marriage when not yet corrupted by her husband. So let these bridegrooms live so faithfully with this righteous wife as to offer good examples of virtue to those regenerated by their help in the spirit and water, let them live to labor in their office which lies within the rampart of the church, with faithful care, as a secular man devotes his care to maintaining his children and his house. For my friend Paul displays that bride to the priests and the other ministers of my altar so that they will choose her as their wife and not seek a carnal spouse. For neither Paul nor my son's other disciples nor the rest of the fathers who were their followers never served as an example to them that they should take a carnal spouse and desert the spiritual wife, who had been their first choice. For a priest who is so stubborn and sin that he does the will of his flesh and illicitly takes a wife commits adultery, for he deserts his true wife, the church, who was betrothed to him by his spiritual office and as his will pleases unchastely marries another. It may be difficult for him to restrain his ardor, but let him restrain himself from these desires for the sake of heavenly love, as my son shows in the Gospel, saying. 70. The Three Kinds of Eunuchs There are eunuchs who were born so from their mother's wombs, and there are eunuchs who were made so by other people and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that can receive this, let him receive it, Matthew 19:12. What does this I mean? There are some men who have come forth from their mother's wombs, with a bodily coldness or impotence, which makes them unable to have wives, and so they will receive no reward for this continence except in suffering no penalties for the deeds of sin they did not do. And there are some men who are maimed in body by the will of others, and so cannot give pleasure to their flesh in the deeds of marriage, but they also do not deserve praise for containing themselves, for although they cannot do the burning deed they often burn with wickedness in their wills. And there are other men, those who take the spiritual way, who deprive themselves of what their bodies might easily accomplish, because they scorn and reject carnal bands for the glory of the celestial inheritance, and these shall have the greatest praise and the blessed reward. And my priests and all who do service to my altar should imitate these last with all their hearts, that they may receive the crown of continence amid the rapture of celestial joy. So if a person can follow this example in his heart, desiring beatitude enough to conquer the body and cast out carnal desire, 
let him with ardent devotion repress his flesh and abandon the idea of carnal union, and so he will capture heavenly companionship. 71. He who cannot contain himself must not become a priest or minister. But he who cannot contain himself, and burns with carnal desire, should not become a priest or any other kind of minister for the sake of pride or avarice, lest he then fall into carnal delights and so sustain great damage. For those who approach my altar as ministers shall keep their bodies from contamination with women, and never for any reason enter into marriage, but voluntarily keep themselves chaste in my righteous service. If they are otherwise, they should avoid the holy service of my altar. 72. Why the primitive church let married men become priests but does not now? It is true that certain people who had previously subjected themselves to the world were at one time allowed to minister. But these were people who had received the carnal yoke before and not after entering my service, and afterward they cast off this yoke, and then the Holy Spirit by his miracles brought about in them praise and celebration. This was granted as an unusual measure at the beginning of the church's rise, because there were so few priests, but now the church is adult and strong, and her ministers are many. This is like church opinion on another prohibition of the same sort, at the beginning of the world it was granted to men to marry women most closely related to them, because there were so few people, whereas now that people are so multiplied it is forbidden. For the shapeless and rough stones customarily laid in the foundation of a building, and afterward the beautiful and well-formed stones are chosen for the walls. And so in the church's infancy the priests who were available were installed in office, but now the whole complement can be obtained among the spiritual people who are fitted for the priesthood, not being occupied with the secular burden of earthly bonds. For it is not fitting that the father of a family, following the rules for earthly marriage, should be called as my messenger in the priesthood. Therefore hear this comparison. 73. Analogy of the King A certain very powerful king gathered a small army and carefully observed its performance. Seeing that it was untrained in an army's business, he chose out of it some men of the common people whom he perceived as suitable for leadership, and set them over the army, for the offspring of the nobles had not yet matured. But later, when the army was larger and there were adult noblemen in it, the king set that army in order and promoted dukes and counts from the nobler classes to command it, as justice required. What does this mean? The king of heaven, whose power is over all, started the church by gathering a little army of believers. Scrutinizing it most closely. He saw that it was as yet infirm and weak with regard to suffering in body for his name so he set Peter over it to bind and loose, who had been one of those who had lived in earthly life. And after Peter, he cleansed others who had imbibed the taste of the earthly and been stained by temporal things, and set them up in the office of judgment and mercy, for he knew that, having embraced the Catholic faith, they were wise and faithful both in caring for souls and in sustaining bodies. For the glowing dawn that burns up human contagions in the fire of love for chastity had not yet diffused its flowers of sweetness widely among people. But now the churchly race has been multiplied and widely disseminated through the whole length of the world, and the glory of the church's honor has been nobly strengthened. And so the supernal king has benignly and fittingly bestowed both secular and spiritual gifts on people, and chosen those who most honorably preserved their sobriety and chastity by church law and God's justice to be priests and other ministers of the divine offices. Wherefore, O human, many spiritual people have now arisen who want to fight the world and the devil and who hasten to approach my altar in chastity and bodily restraint, and so I will that my priest should appear in my sight uncontaminated by earthly marriage. 
For in the Old Testament priests were commanded to keep themselves from contamination with women when they approached my altar, and in the New Testament that command was brought to full perfection for my priests, so that whereas the ancient priests observed chastity for an hour, these new ones will fulfill it from the beginning of their boyhood to the end of their old age. And as I refused to receive the sacrifice from the ancients when polluted by connection with women, much more do I want my son to be handled by the new priests only in a state of chastity. 74. Immature and unconsecrated men must not receive churches. Let no one who is immature and unconsecrated receive a church, and let him not presume to seek several churches. For if one who is young in years and without priestly consecration dares to take a church or, having one, tries to subjugate several, he is a transgressor against justice and a destroyer of strict judgment. He is like one who dares to commit fornication before the lawful time and without lawful marriage, or who has a legitimate wife but hastens to defile himself in adultery with other women. 75. Priests should be elected by Christian people from the good and healthy. Priests of wise thoughts and manly minds are to be chosen from every people that calls itself Christian such that they will come to my service in right order with proper anointing and willing mind. Those who are crippled in any of their members should not approach the office of my altar, for in the kingdom of heaven there will be no trace of disabilities in human souls, and therefore I do not want anyone defective in limb to stand at my altar. But these will not be separated from the kingdom of heaven because they are weak in body and defective in members. As long as their souls are healthy and they seek me in the purity of good works. I do not wish, however, that they should take part in the ministry of my altar, but that they should humbly fulfill their virtue in good works. 76. Women should not approach the office of the altar. So too those of female sex should not approach the office of my altar, for they are an infirm and weak habitation appointed to bear children and diligently nurture them. A woman conceives a child not by herself but through a man, as the ground is plowed not by itself but by a farmer, therefore, just as the earth cannot plow itself, a woman must not be a priest and do the work of consecrating the body and blood of my son, though she can sing the praise of her creator, as the earth can receive rain to water its fruits. And as the earth brings forth all fruits, so in woman the fruit of all good works is perfected. How? Because she can receive the high priest as bridegroom. How? A virgin betrothed to my son will receive him as bridegroom, for she has shut her body away from a physical husband, and in her bridegroom she has the priesthood and all the ministry of my altar and with him possesses all its riches and a widow too can be called the bride of my son when she rejects a physical husband and flees beneath the wings of my son's protection. And as a bridegroom loves his bride with exceeding love, so does my son sweetly embrace his brides, who for love of chastity eagerly run to him. 77. Men and women should not wear each other's clothes except in necessity. A man should never put on feminine dress or a woman use male attire, so that their roles may remain distinct, the man displaying manly strength and the woman womanly weakness, for this was so ordered by me when the human race began. Unless a man's life or a woman's chastity is in danger, in such an hour a man may change his dress for a woman's or a woman for a man's, if they do it humbly in fear of death. And when they seek my mercy for this deed they shall find it, because they did it not in boldness but in danger of their safety, but as a woman should not wear a man's clothes, she should also not approach the office of my altar, for she should not take on a masculine role either in her hair or in her attire. 78. God will judge all perpetrators of fornication, sodomy and bestiality. 
let those who approach my altar appear in my sight and chastity, as also should those who desire to receive the sacrament of the body and blood of my Son, lest they should fall into ruin. For many are found among both spiritual and secular people who not only pollute themselves in fornication with women but also assume a heavy burden of condemnation by contaminating themselves in perverted forms. How? A man who sins with another man as if with a woman sins bitterly against God and against the union with I which God united male and female. Hence both in God's sight are polluted black and wanton, horrible and harmful to God and humanity, and guilty of death, for they go against their Creator and His creature, which is in them. How? God united men and woman, thus joining the strong to the weak, that each might sustain the other. But these perverted adulterers change their virile strength into perverse weakness, rejecting the proper male and female roles and in their wickedness they shamefully follow Satan, who in his pride sought to split and divide him who is indivisible. They create in themselves, by their wicked deeds a strange and perverse adultery, and so appear polluted, and shameful in my sight. And a man who sins with a woman by this same method of perverted fornication is a voracious wolf of wickedness. How? A person would seem perverted and harmful to other people if he threw away beautiful clean food and ate the ordure that comes out of the body and digestion, and these are in my sight equally unworthy and unclean, since they forsake the proper way of uniting with a woman and seek in her an alien sin. And a woman who takes up devilish ways and plays a male role in coupling with another woman is most vile in my sight and so is she who subjects herself to such a one in this evil deed. For they should have been ashamed of their passion, and instead they impudently usurped a right that was not theirs. And, having put themselves into alien ways, they are to me transformed and contemptible. And men who touch their own genital organ and emit their semen seriously imperil their souls, for they excite themselves to distraction, they I appear to me as impure animals devouring their own whelps, for they wickedly produce their semen only for abusive pollution. And women who imitate them in this unchaste touching, and excite themselves to bodily convulsions by provoking their burning lust, are extremely guilty, for they pollute themselves with uncleanness when they should be keeping themselves in chastity. Hence both women and men who elicit their own seed by touching themselves in the body do a filthy deed and inflict ulcers and wounds on their souls, for they will not keep themselves in a state of chastity for love of me. What does this mean? When a person feels himself disturbed by bodily stimulation, let him run to the refuge of continence, and seize the shield of chastity, and thus defend himself from uncleanness. How? Let him cast out the tares from the wheat, which is to say, let him separate the clamor of lust from the sweetness of chastity. And whoever thus casts out of himself the taste for lust is very sweet and lovable to me. But, O oh humans, you cast away chastity and love lust when you fornicate not only with other people but even with animals, thus you send your seed not into what lives but into what is dead and you forsake what is equal to you and desire what is subject to you and serves you. Therefore the elements cry out against you, saying, Alas, alas! Our rulers join with us in the mingling of their seed. And thus they show their grief at my anger against your deeds. Why then do you, knowing yourselves human, convert your intelligence into bestial stupidity? Did I create you to join with animals? never. And when you unite with them, the guilt of the most bitter crimes falls upon you, because you scorn the plan I made for the joining of male and female. For whoever transforms himself by his deeds into a depraved follower of his own desires, and pours out his semen with an animal, brings on himself great ruin, 
as Satan cast himself down by his perversity when he tried to be like God. Therefore, all you who contaminate yourselves with perverted pollutions, resist your desires, chastise your bodies, and give yourselves over to true and bitter penance with weeping and fasting and torture of your flesh and severe blows, lest you send yourselves impenitent into an excess of cruel guilt. 79. Pollution that occurs in sleep. I want men not only to keep themselves clean of impurity while awake, but also to purify themselves properly from the pollution that happens to them in sleep. For if the semen of a man who sleeps and dreams is stirred up unawares, I do not want him to approach the sacramental office of my altar in that condition of ardent heat, he should first calm that ardor in himself, as it is written. 80. Words of Moses on this subject. If any man among you is defiled in a dream by night, he shall go forth out of the camp, and not return until he washes himself with water in the evening, and then he shall return into the camp after sunset, Deuteronomy 13 10 11. What does this mean? If among the laborers in my service there is anyone who is defiled in a dream while he sleeps at night, he should separate himself from the company of those who serve my altar and not presume to join in the mystery until his injurious heat has passed and he has cleansed himself from the fire of his lust in the bath of penance, with confession and compunction of heart. And after that penance has done its work and illumined his heart, let him return in love of chastity among those who faithfully defend themselves against impurity, and worthily and honorably approach that sacrament, which is holy in sanctity. 81. One who burns strongly should not add flame to his fire. But one who burns strongly in lust either asleep or awake should take care not to add flame to his fire. How? Let him not inflame himself by those foods that stir up lust. He should humbly abstain from the flesh of animals that come forth from their mothers naked and without covering, that is, beasts, for there is a fire of heat in them that is not as great in the flesh of birds, which are not born uncovered but as an egg covered with a shell, and therefore have less inflammatory power. And he should also abstain from excessive wine, lest by too much drinking his veins become filled with noxious blood and wickedly heated with ardent fire. 82. One who is weighed down by vices should seek God's mercy in confession. But if anyone labors under too great a number of these tendencies and is not able to resist them by himself, let him with devoted purpose seek me and humbly uncover to me the wounds of his heart. How? Let him lay bare these wounds to me by making a humble confession to a priest. And why this? Because true confession is a second resurrection. How? The human race was slain by the fall of the old Adam, the new Adam by his death raised it up. And so the resurrection of souls arose in the death of the new Adam. And so a person should confess his sins, as the old Adam did not for he concealed his transgression instead of confessing it. How? He did not confess it by repenting, but concealed it by accusing the woman. Hence confession was instituted, to raise people up after they fall. And so anyone who confesses his sins to a priest for love of me rises again from death to life, as the woman who purged herself from her impurity with dares at the banquet in the presence of my son was snatched away from uncleanness. 83. The remedy of purgation was long prefigured in the ancient fathers. This remedy of purgation was long prefigured in the ancient fathers. How? Before the law the patriarchs and prophets were the consolation of humanity, under the law the high priests and the ordinary priests were its instruction, and then the apostles came and brought true righteousness in my son, so that many people hastened to them and devoutly implored their help. 
And thus from the time of Adam to the time of the Apostles there were always some who by celestial inspiration consoled and instructed people and helped them in their miseries. And the Apostles also showed people, by their preaching and many miracles, that man had fallen by the devil's tempting into death and could never rise again by himself, but was snatched from death by my son. How? By his being in the world and performing many labors in the body, and at last being nailed to the cross for the world's redemption. So faithful people, to gain salvation, should follow this pattern with their priests. How? They should seek the help of my son, because when they repeat the ancient crime of Adam after baptism they cannot rise from their fall by themselves. And therefore they should seek counsel as if from the patriarchs and prophets, and derive instruction as if from the high priests and the ordinary priests, and accept help as if from the apostles, laying bare their wounds and displaying their sins truly and purely. How? They should confess their sins to the priest, who is the minister of my son, with devoted heart and mouth. And then the priest will give them a remedy of penance and bury their sins in the death of my only begotten. And then they will rise again to life and glorify the resurrection of my son. 84. One who refuses to confess his sin deceives himself. But one who refuses to lay bare the wounds of sin, and follows his own wishes by trying to cure them himself in silence without the help of another is deceiving himself. For he wishes to be his own priest, but without the help of another he cannot rise, as man did not rise up and stand by himself but was saved by my son. Hence let one who desires to be saved never despair of confessing his sins, even at the end of his life. 85. A dying man without a priest may confess to another person or to God only. And if someone in the hour of death seeks a remedy for his wounds of sin but does not have a priest near to whom to confess them, let him show them to any other person who is there at the time, or, if he is dying so suddenly that there is no one there, let him lay them open to me with his heart's utmost affection while he is still in the body with which he did them and I will regard the devotion of his heart and not reject his penitence. 86. No one should despair at the weight of his sins. Therefore, let no one despair because of the weight of his iniquity, for if he despairs of my mercy, he shall not rise again to life. One who struggles with despair and at last reduces it to nothing has delivered himself. He has been strong, and manfully conquered. But one whose mind is so inflamed that he does not seek the remedy of salvation is not to be helped, for when he could have found me, he refused to seek me. And so, let each person not neglect himself while he has time, but seek the refuge of pure confession, as my son commanded the leper in the Gospel, saying. 87. Words of the Gospel Go, show yourself to the priest, and offer your gift, which Moses commanded for a testimony to them, Matthew 8 to 4. What does this mean? You who are foul with sins and want to cleanse yourself of them, go with good intention and show them to the priest, my minister, by pure confession, and offer with devout heart the gift of true penitence which by God's will was foreshadowed by the man who was removed by divine power from the many floods of earthly iniquity. And thus those who formerly saw you befouled with evil deeds may now testify that you are purged from them by bitter penitence as in the furnace of trial. But, O oh human, if a sinner conceals his deeds in his secret heart, who will be a witness to his penitence? No one. Therefore let each person manifest his sins, that he may have a witness to his penitence. 88. Sins should be blotted out by alms and by bodily satisfaction. And let one who desires to practice penitence for his sins turn to alms as a source of help. How? When a person's weak body falters in the work of penitence, 
his alms will hasten to help him. And because it is hard for a person to practice penitence with just and proper harshness, let him take alms as his mother, so as to accomplish with her what is so laborious for his body. For a mother does not cease to help her child in time of need, even when he has been brought up already, and so two alms give aid to a weak body when a person is penitent, even if he seems to be strong in doing penance and punishing his body. So let a person punish in his body the evil works he has done in his body through the lust of the flesh, so as to wash away from his body by bitter penance the deeds that were dear and sweet to his flesh. For bitter penance, with its help meet alms, heals in people the deadly wounds of sin. How? A person represses himself by castigation, but he can refresh himself by alms. How? Because alms represent my mercy. How? When a faithful person helps the poor with his substance for love of me, he keeps my commandments, because he devotes his mercy to the needy for the honor of my name, just as I do not withdraw my grace from those who seek me in purity of heart. And whoever helps the poor in this way, refreshing them with alms for mercy's sake, is exceedingly lovable to me, for he has a merciful heart, which fulfills what is written. 89. Words of the Book of Wisdom Place your treasure in the commandments of the Most High, and your alms shall bring you more profit than gold, Ecclesiastes 29 hours 14 minutes. What does this mean? Think justly and rightly, and take some of your material wealth, which you hold in your bosom and embrace in your heart, as the one who is above all people commands, divide it, for God has ordered you to turn aside from evil and do good. Let your heart's good will overflow, so that you will not be among the last sheep, sanctify yourself before God by giving of your substance to refresh those in want, and God will give you his mercy in your misery. And if you do this, the compassion you have on one without treasure will be worth more to you than if you could ascend a high mountain and in your pride possess its gold. How? Because it is better for you to give a little to the little ones in humility than to possess and enjoy the kingdom of the world, if you did the latter, God's reward of mercy could never be yours because of the weight of your pride for you would not have had pity for the poor in your heart. 90. The elements of the world are the pit of human pleasures. Hence the elements are the pit of human pleasures, as they show by their ways. How? By bringing God's vengeance upon those who are sinning. Therefore, O human, renounce the empty avarice which will wreck you, for your true inheritance is eternal life, leave evil and do good and so renounce harsh malevolence. And, to follow the way of mercy, give of your substance to the poor, and thereby imitate God who is merciful. 91. One who gives or receives alms must not do so in vain. Therefore, O human, no liar can deny that you who thus help the poor are fulfilling my will. How? You should give your alms to the poor as I mete out my grace to you. But let not those who receive alms take them vainly or avariciously. What does this mean? There are many who love laziness and do not want to labor with their bodies to feed themselves, or to do good works with their spirits to help their souls, they are like the beasts, who understand just as neither with their souls nor with their bodies. And if they persevere in this, Without correction and without penitence for their apathetic wickedness, they are unworthy in my sight. But there are also many who suffer bodily necessity and receive alms in fear of me, and pray and work for those who weigh at mercy to them, and avoid filthy and evil deeds. And among these are many from whom I have withdrawn earthly riches in order to give them celestial wealth. 92. Seekers of Poverty riches and honor are rewarded by their intention. Those who gladly suffer poverty for my name's sake are extremely lovable to me, 
but those who are greedy and would gladly possess earthly riches but cannot lose the reward of this labor. And one who seeks riches in order to satisfy not his greed but my will has a good intention, and I will reward him with honor. One who desires the power of an office for his own boastful pride and not for the glory of my name is to me like a putrid corpse, but one who seeks it desiring from it not his pride but my honor will be glorious in my kingdom. And so priests should take on the office of spiritual government not for their own sakes but for mine, that they may rule more surely and devoutly over my people. How? 93. Priests should admonish the people about confession. They should teach, admonish, exhort and urge my people to keep the law of God worthily and fittingly. And pastors should always be thinking this over, and they should warn and exhort the people not to continue in their sins without confession and without penitence, but to tread evil deeds underfoot and do good ones. And if the people do not obey their priests when they so admonish, the people will incur the guilt and the priests will not be blamed for negligence. 94. Priests who do not use their office's authority are not priests but wolves. But if priests do not show the people the authority of their office, they are not priests but ravenous wolves, for they hold their office by robbery as a wolf cruelly snatches a sheep doing their own will instead of caring for the sheep. And, because they live perversely, they are afraid to teach true doctrine to the people, they consent to iniquity as to a lord, for they harbor carnal desires, and they close the door of their heart to a helper as if to a stranger, and justice as of God. 95. The elements wail to God at the iniquity of priests and heaven notes it. Therefore, O ye pastors, wail and lament your crimes, which proclaim your iniquity in dire tones, so that the very elements hear their clamor and join in their wailing before my presence. How do you dare to do your office and touch your Lord with bloody hands, in perverse filth and adulterous wickedness? By your uncleanness you shake the foundations of the earth. How? Because you do not fear to touch your Lord while foul with such crimes, I bring great griefs and oppressions upon the earth, and so I avenge the flesh and blood of my Son, for in this horror you not only cruelly shake the earth but by your filth contaminate heaven. How? When you touch your Lord in the stench of uncleanness, as a swine tramples pearls into the mire. The heavens receive your iniquity and shower upon the earth the sentence of my judgment. You should have gone before the people in true justice and with divine law, shining for them with good works, so that when they followed you they would avoid tripping on any stumbling block, and instead you stain my people with greater iniquity than that with which they stain themselves, giving them a bad and evil example. You should have been a shining jewel by whose light they could have perceived and entered the path of rectitude, but your example is death to them, and they can find no measure in your iniquity. How can you be their shepherd when you seduce them so? And how will you answer for them, when you cannot give an answer for yourselves? Therefore weep and howl, before death carries you off. For why do you not consider your own honor? which is given you for the sake of other people. What does this mean? 96. Priests have the power of binding and loosing. That you, rather than others, have received in my son the keys of heaven, which are righteous decisions of just judgment made in the knowledge of the scriptures, as long as you consider rightly what it is you should bind. What does this mean? When people stubbornly oppose themselves to my law, you must inspire them with fear of my judgment and if they do not then correct themselves, extend over them your power of binding. How? You will bind these rebels in my words with a clear voice, and show them the power of the binding, for their stubbornness they are bound in my sight, as my son showed to the church's first pastor, saying. 97. Words of the Gospel 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth, it will be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth, it will be loosed also in heaven. Matthew 16 19. What does this mean? I, who have all power in heaven and earth, by my grace give to you, my devout imitators, those judgments that touch the dignity of the kingdom of heaven. As you see people sin on earth, you will bind the wicked deed on earth with just judgment, and it will be entangled in its wickedness and bound in heaven, it will be separated and driven out from heaven, for in the heavenly mansions there is no freedom and no place for iniquity. But after I withdraw person's soul from his body, you will not extend your judgment over him, for that judgment is mine. Likewise, if a transgressor is penitent, you will loose on earth the chain you fastened on him in his rebellion, and it will be loosed in the secret places of heaven, for God does not reject the groans of a devout heart. But after the person's death you will pray for his soul, but you cannot then absolve it from being bound. 98. No one is to be bound without a grievous fault. But, O priests, who have received this power thus from my Son, you shall not in anger of heart bind any person in my words unless he has committed a grievous fault, you will consider most carefully before you bind anyone. You will use my words of ecclesiastical censure to separate from my church anyone who cannot be restrained by shame before other people, or by fear of me, or by your prayers and precepts, but seeks to persevere in his iniquity. But you shall not bind an innocent person, for when you bind such a one you bind yourselves in bands of dire guilt. 99. One who is bound when innocent must ask to be loosed for God's honor. And if anyone has been bound while innocent, contrary to right, he must ask to be loosed for the honor of my name, yet humbly and submissively, for if he is stubborn he might incur the guilt of pride. But this is the purpose of that binding, that one who perversely refuses to obey me or the precepts of his superiors may be separated by my word from celestial things. Thus Adam, when he disobeyed me, was by my command cast out of paradise. And until he repents and obeys, he shall not be received into the company of the faithful, as the human race was recalled to the celestial country by the martyrdom of my obedient son. 100. Rebels who refuse to return to Christ and ask mercy imitate the devil. But one who rebels and refuses to return to Christ in humility, and continues in this arrogance, will join the company of those who keep a stone for a heart and remain in infidelity, and such people refuse to know the glory of the church's beatitude. For one who is so obdurate that in his wickedness he will seek no mercy imitates the ancient serpent, who, when he deceived the first man in paradise, was saying within himself. 101. Words of the Devil I was thrown out of heaven when I tried to fight with my angels against the army of the Most High, I could not resist him, and he conquered me. But now I have found man on earth, and I will avenge myself mightily by working my wrath on him. For I will accomplish in man on earth that which I tried to do in heaven, and make myself like the Most High. And if God is just, that power will not be taken from me, for man will consent to me and disobey God. Saying these things to himself, the devil arrayed all his arts against man, and man withdrew from God and adhered to the devil, and the devil bound him so closely to himself that man worshipped him instead of God and denied God, his Creator. 102. By the Son of God's incarnation humanity was led out of the darkness. But when humanity was lying in a great darkness of infidelity and could not raise itself, I sent my Son for its salvation miraculously incarnate of the Virgin, true God and true man. What does this mean? That his divinity truly came forth from me, 
the Father, and his humanity truly took flesh from, the Virgin Mother. What does this mean? O oh human, you are soft and delicate of body, but hard and inflexible in your incredulity. For a stone can be smoothed for a building, but you are unwilling to be soothed by the faith yet listen. As a person who has a beautiful jewel in a box puts it in a metal setting to show it to people, so I, who had my son in my heart, willed him to be incarnate of the Virgin to save the lives of those who believe. But if I had given him a physical father, who would he be then? Not my son, but my servant, and that could not be. He, born of the Virgin, ate, drank, lay down to sleep and experienced bodily miseries, but he never felt the taste of sin in his flesh, for he had assumed flesh not through a lie but through truth. What does this mean? Other people, because of Adam and Eve's transgression, are born from the taste of delight, which is to say through a lie and not the truth. But my son did not originate so but was born in sanctity from the most chaste virgin to redeem humanity. For luck cannot loose like from a chain, a greater one must come who can save him. What does this mean? That no person born in sin could deliver sinful humanity from the perdition of death. Therefore my son came, without sin, he conquered death and mercifully delivered humanity therefrom. But let the one who sees with watchful eyes and hears with attentive ears welcome with a kiss my mystical words, which proceed from me who am life.